Maybe. I don't know. Let's see what happens. Can anybody hear us? See us? They'll have to tell us that they see us. <laughs> Scott Bragdon says, keep hitting that like button. You know it's going to be good. Uh, you can only hit the hit it once. So, And if you hit it again, then you unlike it. Vote early, vote often. <laughs> what are you voting about? Well, people are, are liking the video, liking the stream, but the liking the show on YouTube, but they don't know that it's going to be any good. But of course it's going to be good. It's going to be great. Hey, everybody. Yes. Welcome to uh, a fairly regular episode of the Weekly Space Hangout. Uh, except we're down two cast members this week, uh, so both uh, uh, both of the the missing folk are are busy this week. But but uh, Paul and I are here to uh, to sort of handle everything. Give you Morgan a Morgan and Kimberly are, yeah, they're they're something houses. They are, really carry it. They <laughs> really carry the broadcast. <laughs> yeah, um, but I'm going to say hi to a bunch of people. I'm going to say hi to Astro B, Avi Scott and Flower, Bill Sugden. Bob Harkins, Bob Moeller, Christian Woodland, Colin Edwards, Cosmic Lettuce, David Fairweather, David Hall, De Havilland 2000, Frank Tippin, Grant Lanning, John Musk, Johnny J, Johnny Zed, Larry Beckham, Nancy Graziano, Nightbot. Hey, Nightbot, here watching, guarding us carefully. Wow. Par par Paranor, Ryan's Spangenberg. I hope we did it okay. Scott Bragdon, Seferin, Space TV, Tom Van Scotter, Uncle Bill Druin. William Bacon and Zap Fan, Zap Fan. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. The, Fra the Fraser and Kraken show. I'm so sorry, Paul. Mm -hmm. It's all right. I don't mind being top typecast if it means a steady income. <laughs> Is that how that works? You're you're only going to get gigs as a um, skeptical astrophysicist now? In Tinkerous, <laughs> skeptical. Yeah you know, take the wind out of people, say the wet blanket of the yeah. party. But is, is the that guy who goes... The guy who goes, actually, <laughs> actually, that's not a thing. Have, has this happened yet? Has anyone else like asked you to provide the skeptical view for, for like some kind of space news discovery? Uh, people ask me for my view and then they get the skeptical view. They don't realize oh, okay. it hasn't quite Right. And so they're like, you know, I get producers or, you know, newscasters like, Paul, Paul, can you comment on this? And I get on the air or something or on tape and I'm like, yeah, it's dumb and don't pay attention. And they're like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is nonsense. Uh, yeah. That was actually my very, very first TV appearance. Uh, it was like two months after I started my podcast and local news reached out to our department, reached out to me. They came out to my house to film and everything. It was all about some dumb story about uh, like, oh, maybe the Big Bang didn't happen. You know, one of these things. And then like, I'm sitting there talking to the reporter. I'm like, yeah, the Big Bang totally happened. And, you know, we have lots of evidence and this paper is dumb. <laughs> and, and he loved it. He loved it. And he started putting me on monthly on their Columbus morning show. That's that's fantastic. So I, so I guess I guess I, that's how I got my start. I, I my have an opinion. I've been I've been thinking about this, and I have an opinion that there is this, just this journey that you make as a space nerd. And so you start out watching your science fiction and your Star Wars and your Star Trek, and you're like warp drives and anti gravity and all this kind of stuff. And you that's what sort of gets you interested in the, mm -hmm. in it. But then as you go, you know, further and further you realize that a lot of this stuff is just not practical and possible and it's still going to be, you know, it's going to show up never. And you get more and more interested in just the nuances, the really interesting discoveries, the tweaks and the changes and the things like that, that are, um, that are more realistic and more fascinating. Yeah. And I think that that just, it's just this journey that people make, you know, they show up and they're like, are wormholes real? And then, you know, two years later, they're like, what is the, why did I even ask that? I was so embarrassed. Sure, yeah, but they're more interested in, for and example, now they're asking, yeah, like microwave properties of nanoparticles. Yeah. How how can I observe variable stars? That kind of thing. 
So it's quite interesting that you're bringing this up because this is definitely not how I got started or got interested in astronomy. Well, don't don't tell us. We got to start the show. So, uh, oh, you got to yeah, we haven't started the show. We are live, but we haven't actually started this show yet. So let's let's do that, and cool. then um, we will uh, find out all about you. Hold on. Oh dear. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. There's me. There's my intro stuff. All right. Here we go. Welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, June 13th, 2018. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about how to measure the mass of a galaxy. Uh, should we colonize the moon or Mars? Or should India colonize the moon or Mars? Um, uh, poor opportunity is in a really bad state right now. And uh, space diamonds, explaining microwave emissions. And maybe we will talk about the Fermi paradox. So joining me this week, we've got Dr. Paul Matt Sutter. Hey, finally you start with me because there's nobody else. <laughs> there's nobody else. So I get billing there's... for the finally. See, do you know what it? You see, you can't see it, but maybe people who can see on the side of the screen, I'm at the top, and then well, there's our special guest, and then there's Paul Matt Sutter. Maybe it's alphabetical. So Kimberly and Morgan show up, and that's why I just yeah. go through it alphabetically. You know, and I understand. So having a last name at the tail end of the alphabet, I'm used to it. It's cool. Uh, I, I, it doesn't stop me from being bitter. Yeah. So. I've always enjoyed having a name that's at the top of the alphabet. It's been good for me. <laughs> you have. Yeah, I, I, really, have. I really have. All right. And our special guest, uh, Stella Kafka. Welcome. Hi. Hi, everyone. So uh, we're going to do the interview portion of this, but and then you, Stella, you're going to stick around and uh, talk about some of the stories with us this week since uh, Morgan and Kimberly are, I don't know, doing something. Uh, so uh, Stella, why don't you tell people who you are and what you do? So uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Stella Kafka. I am a, an astrophysicist, and right now I'm the director of the American Association of Variable Star Observers. Um, so I am in Cambridge, Massachusetts, physically. Uh, I have been in this uh, function for three years now, a little bit more than three years now, and I'm here to tell you all about uh, the organization itself and how you can actually observe variable stars contribute to cutting edge science. All right, well, before we get too deep into how people can get involved, mm. let's talk a bit about just the, the history of variable stars and how mm. important that's been just for the field of astronomy. Well, variable stars actually get everywhere, um, everywhere you can imagine when it comes to uh, defining fundamental properties of stars. So through variable star astronomy, you can uh, determine masses, radii, luminosities, temperatures, structures, magnetic fields, evolution, anything that you can imagine about stars. Um, variable stars are being used very frequently now to define the distance ladder in the universe. Distances are extremely difficult to, to measure, so we're using their properties in order to determine how far away things are from us. Um, cosmology uh, is based on variable star properties, supernovae, all these distant objects that are actually defining that the universe is actually vast, it's accelerating, and there's this magic thing called dark energy that is driving this acceleration. Actually, this result quite recently got uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics, right, back in 2011. Um, you form elements heavier than uh, hydrogen and helium in variable stars, or the interior of them. Uh, you, we try to understand uh, exoplanets, planet formation, creation, life, how life actually came to be through understanding uh, variable stars. Our sun is a variable star, as simple as that. Trying to understand our own neighborhood uh, requires understanding of variable stars. So that is extremely relevant to our personal interests and our interests of understanding probing fundamental properties of the universe. So um, the cool thing about variable stars is that they can be observed with um, your naked eyes, they can be observed with telescopes. They can be observed from everywhere. Uh, and in principle, anyone can actually do this kind of science. And this is what, um, what the AVSO is all about as well. So, um, And some of the biggest discoveries in the field of cosmology and astrophysics were made thanks to variable stars. Let's talk a bit about that idea of the distance ladder. Mm. How do astronomers use variable stars as a way to know how far away something is? 
So you start by understanding, trying to understand properties such as uh, pulsation periods and brightness variations. Um, back at the beginning of last century, there was a young lady that was working at uh, the Harvard Observatory. Her name is Henrietta Levitt. And she discovered that there was a, a correlation between uh, the brightness and um, the period of a specific type of stars called Cepheid variables. These were uh, located uh, towards one of the Magellanic Clouds, one of our, our um, satellite galaxies. Based on those, she managed to actually determine the distance to, uh, to the Magellanic Cloud. And she uh, evolved, evolved in this kind of technique. She determined a, a method of actually measuring distances at Cepheids um, and with there at the location of, of Cepheid variables, so at different parts of the galaxy. Uh, we are using Cepheids right now in order to determine distances in, in uh, local galaxies as well. So this is one of the steps of the distance ladder. So by determining a distance from the Earth to a, one of those uh, pulsating variables, we know more or less how far away their vicinity is, their neighborhood is. But that gets us up to the Andromeda galaxy or perhaps some of the, the nearby bright ones. Um, you, if we really need to determine distances further, uh, deeper in the galaxy, you need to find different uh, stars that have uniform properties that are what we call standard candles, meaning that they are the same no matter where we look. Uh, and these are the supernova 1As uh, that we are using to, to probe distances further, uh, further out. Is, is that a variable star? I mean, you get one variable, right? It just goes kaboom. Exactly, Does it's that... eruptive. <laughs> so it's it's what we call an eruptive variable. Sadly, you don't get to see it again, but it is a type of a variable star. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, the Cepheid variables are really fascinating because, as you said, you can see some of them with your own with your own eyes, can't you? Some of mm -hmm. the variables are are so bright, and if you could get really close and see what's actually happening to the star, what would you see? What you would see is actually a star changing in size with time and on time scales that you can actually measure. Just imagine a, a, a sun expanding and contracting. Um, actually, we know of pulsating stars that are changing up to 50% in size during a pulsation cycle. These are not exactly Cepheids, or, these are different beasts, but um, that's exactly what a, a pulsation is, the physical change of the size of a star. As it, so as it contracts and expands, its brightness changes slightly, and this is what we are recording when we are observing observing it again and again, changes in right. its brightness. And, and so if I understand right, the trick is, is that the, the brightness of the star perfectly matches this this curve and so you can see these stars and if you can time how fast they're brightening and dimming then you know absolutely how bright they are and then you can just measure it relatively and then that tells you how far away these things are more or less yes yeah yeah yes. that's the <laughs> lay person's version of that um quite accurate though but but and and that is magic i mean i think it's you know i think what henrietta levitt discovered was really for the first time to be able to understand how far away things are just like how big our universe is how how did she then take that knowledge to try and understand our our place in the universe well henrietta was not exactly a very power, powerful figure about 100 years ago you have to remember that women were not exactly considered researchers uh, she was in a group that was more open-minded than others uh, so she was allowed to actually um, discuss her ideas with colleagues, but uh, back in the time, women were not considered to be equal astronomers as, as men. Um, so it took uh, several decades until um, she was given credit for yeah. that discovery. Let me put it this way. So the method actually did pick up. It was verified. It was confirmed. It started being used um, by Henrietta herself. Um, I think she died before she was given credit. But Hubble, and, that, and this was the technique that yeah. Hubble used to, to, you know, figure out that the, the Big Bang was happening. That the Big Bang was happening and that uh, all these island universes uh, will consider are, are just galaxies. So we are one, in one of multiple galaxies uh, in the universe. That is correct. Yeah. So um, Henrietta was a very smart young, young woman. I, I can't imagine what she would have discovered if she was uh, allowed to actually uh, do research the way that we are doing research right now. Um, nonetheless, she paved the road for her. 
uh, for other discoveries. You have to remember, we are uh, standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about variable star astronomy these days and just sort of, mm. um, and how the AAVSO, like, what sort of role does your organization play with the observers and the public? Like, where do you sort of position yourselves in this? Mm. So the AVSO, American Association of Variable Star Observers, is an organization that started in 1911 um, at the Harvard Observatory uh, under the protection principles, the Harvard Observatory director, when he, he gathered a group of amateur astronomers to actually take data for his own research projects. And as part of that data that uh, they were taking, uh, they were actually creating uh, sky charts of interesting stars, uh, and they were indicating which stars are uh, are to be compared with the variable stars. So which ones are the variable stars in the sky and which ones are constant? Remember, something that is something is variable, something is changing with respect to something else that doesn't. So it's pretty much a comparative science. You have a star that you suspect is changing in brightness, and you have five stars that you know that they don't change in brightness simply because they haven't shown any indications. So you compare your suspected variables brightness with everything else to actually find a close or much in its brightness. And by doing that, you see that its brightness is increasing or decreasing with time. And this is how you determine variability. So this is a, a very straightforward way of actually assessing how a star is brightening or dimming within time scales of a night or, or a week or a month. And this is something that you can do just by um, by using binoculars or a telescope or even a DSLR camera. Since 1911, when we started here, um, we have really grown. We are more than a thousand members all over the world. We're international and we're both amateur, professional astronomers, um, observers, members from all over the world, educators, you name what, anyone is actually part of our organization. I want to see the AVSO as a big collaboration because pretty much without everybody's contribution, we can't uh, build light curves to understand the history of variability of stars. We, we can't understand how they work. This is how you actually probe interiors of stars and their properties. So anyone who is actually contributing data are actually contributing to science, They're trying to understand how those things work. So. Um, the mission of the AAVSO as a nonprofit organization is to enable anyone anywhere to participate in scientific discovery through variable star astronomy. And by enable, um, we mean that we are actually offering the means, we're trying to offer the training, we're trying to actually help people understand how to do this kind of business uh, and contribute the best way that they can with the means that they have. Uh, anyone and anywhere means that we, we don't really care about people's socioeconomic background, we don't really care where they are located, we don't care if they have an accent or not. Um, so what we care about is that they, they really want to contribute meaningfully uh, in astronomy. They're interested in trying to help us understand um, some of the most dynamic, the most crazy, the most eruptive, the most variable objects in the night sky. Um, and as long as they are willing to interact with us in a, in a, a respectful way, they are part of our collaboration and participate means that they are part of the discussion. It's not just uh, reading about something or uh, looking at other people doing stuff. So our observers are participating by taking data. We have people who take data on the sun. We measure sunspots. So you don't even need to stay up at night in order to observe a variable star as long as you have the proper filter. Um, we have people who use, as I said, binoculars or DSLR cameras or, or even have their own observatories. Um, I'm a professional astronomer. Uh, I have been using professional facilities for, oh gosh, longer than I want to admit, um, more than 15 years now. But a couple of years ago, I started my own binoculars program. Uh, using my little binoculars and my eyes, trying to measure, estimate myself uh, variations in the brightness of stars. And, and boy, that's an experience. Just it's it, you're witnessing something that is happening real life, real time. It's just I mean, I think that I mean a lot of people think that astronomers have the night sky fully observed all the time. They see everything that's going on in the night sky, but the reality is the sky is big and. And this idea of sort of time based astronomy that things are changing every night up in the sky and that we're only just catching the occasional glimpses of it. So what are some of the kinds of discoveries that amateurs have helped to to discover? Oh, gosh. Um, 
I don't even know where to start from at this point. It's just like, I mean, aviosaurs. Um, is that what amateur, you call them? Aviosaurs? No, aviosaurs. We're all yeah. a community, right? Yeah. Um, and you know something? Uh, when we talk about amateur astronomers, you have to be careful. We are all amateur astronomers. We all love astronomy, right? doesn't really matter whether we do or we don't have a degree. At some point, some of us chose, for better or worse, to, to make a, a living out of this business. Um, so we're all in principle amateur astronomers. Our observers uh, are, are taking data on a great variety of, of uh, objects and projects. Some of them are requests by professional astronomers. So if you have a project, um, say, to take observation of the Hubble Space Telescope, and you would like to, to have some ground-based observations on your star to, to see what uh, the, the Hubble Space Telescope is observing um, uh, how it changes with time, then we are actually recommending those stars to our observers to observe. So this is one way that they contribute. Another way, actually, believe it or not, most of the, the most interesting bright novae in the night sky are being observed by stargazers, by, by non-professional stargazers. Because, you know, if you think about it, uh, being an observer without actually having your livelihood depending on that job, is fun mm -hmm. and it allows you to observe whatever you want whenever you want it. right so some of the most fascinating discoveries have been um uh have been done by our observers simply because they were curious about an object they were looking at the right place at the right time they decided to follow up uh that uh that star or that object with their own telescopes they formed collaborations they were part of a, a collaboration that provided very unique data we have to realize right now that we, we live right now in the golden era of variable star astronomy. Anyone who's anyone wants to actually look and see what's happening in the dynamic night sky because we can't. But the problem is that we don't have enough hands on deck. We yeah. don't have enough facilities. We just don't. It's exactly what you said. The sky is vast. And if you add the extra dimension of time, we really need to look at the same thing for a long time, continuously, in order to understand its properties, then what you really need is an, an army of millions of telescopes, <laughs> right. each observing one star yeah. for years and years in order to get a glimpse in their life. Yeah. There, yeah. There's not enough time. So, so one I... of the things that the AVSO is doing is actually trying to focus those activities and trying to focus people's attention on specific targets right. of the and so, so let's not... say that a, a person who's watching or listening to this wants to get involved, mm -hmm. you know, has some knowledge of astronomy, has some gear. How can they how can they participate? I can get started. Actually, uh, the best way to get started is to go to the AVSO webpage, www.avso.org, and go to our manuals. We have ma training material that uh, addresses all types of training, all types of, of, of observing modes from visual, binocular, DSLR, uh, solar, safe solar observing, do not look at the sun directly with your eyes, right? Um, to uh, CCD observing, PEP observing, how to observe exoplanets. Actually, our manuals are being translated in as many languages as we can, exactly because we really want to reach people in languages that they, they uh, understand. But simply reading a manual because it was written by non-professionals for non-professionals can actually get your hands uh, dirty, get you started. From there, you can actually contact us. Uh, we can provide a mentor for you, someone who can actually sit with you and, and help you understand what you do and how to do it or bounce ideas off of you. You can actually send us some data and we can check and, and uh, help you understand how to take better data. That's why we're here, actually. We are here to help observers improve their observing technique. And in principle, as I said, all it takes is a pair of binoculars. Yeah. Um, the only thing that I can, we cannot help with is clear skies. <laughs> I haven't discovered a cloud blower yet or a cloud filter, so there's nothing I can do about that. Amateur radio astronomers? I don't know if that's there, a way. There are some amateurs, radio astronomers at the AVSO, we are archiving, we have a database of data actually. So people are, are submitting their data to us. Uh, our database is only for visual observation. So we don't do radio. Um, I think that amateur radio astronomy is picking up, um, but I don't know as much about it. Yeah. Um, well, we, we're going to 
switch over to the news portion, but I just want to sort of give mm. people one one place that they can go. So go to it's aavso.org, right? That's your website. That is correct. And yes. that's where you are on Twitter. And I, you know, I've been a big fan of the AVSO for for years and a lot of the times that's one of the first places that I recommend to people when they're like you know, I I love reading about all the space news, and I want to get involved. What's a project that I can get involved in? And that was one of the reasons why we started up CosmoQuest is to sort of help people get involved in in science. But the AVSO is just a, is a great way. I mean, you can discover a planet with Actually, micro lensing, right? Like it's crazy what you can, what can be done with an amateur and a fairly small telescope. So. Absolutely. And right now we are training our observers. We, we have online uh, courses as well, seminars. We're training our observers to observe exoplanets to help with uh, the test satellite uh, follow up. So uh, at some point we are being the, very um, uh, proactive in order to make sure that our community can participate in high profile projects. So you can go to our webpage and, and look at all our educational material. You can contact us. Um, AVSO at AVSO.org. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Actually, uh, I usually post on Facebook anything that is interesting in the news about variable stars, the variable universe, etc. So you can you can find out what's what's cool, what's new, what's happening Great. through our Facebook as well. Wonderful, Stella. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. But you're going to stick around and and yes. join us, join Paul and I as we talk about the news. So. Uh, before we move on to that portion, I just want to uh, remind everyone and give a big thanks to the Weekly Space Hangout crew. This is, of course, the community, uh, who the, the fans, the, the executive producers of this show, they organized Stella. I didn't do it. And so um, if there are guests that you want to have here on this show, all you have to do is just join the community. They will give you your marching orders, help you be an executive producer of the Weekly Space Hangout, and then you can go and, and bring some other guests on. So go to wshcrew.space, and you can find out more. Um, all right, Paul, are you ready? It's me. Let's do it. All right, uh, let's start with measuring the mass of a galaxy. Yeah, an even trickier issue is measuring the size of a galaxy and not just any galaxy, but our galaxy. So here's a thought experiment, Fraser. How would you, Mr. Kane, mm -hmm. top of the alphabet, measure the size, go about measuring the size of the Milky Way? I, I would, based on the guests that we've already had today, I would go looking for variable stars and try to find the <laughs> most distant variable star that I could find within the galaxy and use that as the lower bound for how big the galaxy is. That's smart. That's what I would do too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's actually not a bad idea. It's a, it's about Nobel finding... Prize, please. It's not, not <laughs> calm down. Calm down. <laughs> it's uh, Stella gets it first. And it's, it's not a bad idea because you, what you want to do is exactly that. Identify some marker for stars that belong to our galaxy and decide that these are the ones that belong. They have some sort of property that you can measure. Then you go out and look at a whole bunch of stars and you find the furthest star that matches those properties, right? That's what he said. That's what I said. That's what I said. I'm, I'm flushing it out <laughs> yeah, a little bit yeah, more. Yeah. So and any sort of property would be useful. And especially we want to find stars that belong to the disk of the galaxy rather than the halo of the galaxy because stars that quote unquote belong to our galaxy exist in up to incredibly large radii, uh, but they're in a loose ball-like configuration, just kind of zipping around orbiting our galaxy. We don't really want to think of those as part of the disk of our galaxy, the main central core in the suburbs of the disk and the arms and the spiral. And so we want to look for stars that belong to the disk. And maybe Stella can help us tell us about some properties of stars that ought to belong to the disk and not the halo. Ooh. So on the, sp on the, on the spiral arm. On the spot. Ah. So you need to find stars that move in a certain way, right? Mm -hmm. So they have yeah. to move on the plane on the disk and they have to move around the, the central area. 
Yep. So, so motion, uh, metallicity, color. There's uh, Stella doesn't quite believe in metallicity. Tell us about that. Well, our galaxy has this kind of um, uh, tendency of eating neighboring galaxies. So it has a sort of uh, mix, it, it, it stars are mixed up. It's a material from its galaxy itself and from other galaxies as well. So metallicity can be a, a very um, dishonest factor when you're trying to identify stars from the, the disk. It's interesting you say that because the this latest result uh, saying, you know, the headlines are saying the Milky Way is twice as big as we thought. Uh, it's based on the, the metallicity distribution of disk stars versus mm. halo stars. Halo stars are much more uh, metal poor, though. And it has to do with the, their orbits are completely different than the disk stars. So there, there's more than one parameters in general that play in this. Right, right. So uh, would you, given like this one result, this one paper that you haven't read, mm -hmm. uh, is <laughs> one paper enough to change your mind? Like, you know, what does it take? I would like to see what kind of data they use. And I would like to see how the measurements were made. And I would like to see the error bars. It's all in the error bars. It's always the it's error bars. All in the error bars. So I would like to see how the measurement was made. Yeah, um, I, I think we talked about this last week and I bring this up a lot on my own shows, like all the interesting discussions in science are about error bars. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. I believe you would use that to uh, to refute the EM drive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The EM drive results were no results because the error bars were too big. There was no signal there. Um, and, in the, and so this paper, like. It's an interesting paper. If it's along the right direction, then this mm -hmm. does extend the uh, known size of our stellar disk of the Milky Way out to at least 26 kiloparsec in radius, which is large. It's like 80,000 light years or something. Yeah. And possibly out to 31 kiloparsec. Oh. Uh, and so it could be right. It could be wrong. There are definitely stars out there. That's not the question is, is do they belong to the disk of the galaxy or not? That's the discussion. It's funny. I didn't look too much into what you had, which story you had had picked this week, but I actually recall a different story that used a different method to get to a similar size of the Milky Way. And I apologize. It was like looking at blobs of gas that were orbiting around the, mm. the Milky Way and they were sort of measuring the motions of those blobs of gas and using that as a way to predict the size. But it, it really does seem like now the size of Andromeda and the size of the Milky Way, like as Andromeda is getting closer to us, it's shrinking and the Milky Way is expanding. And when they do finally meet, they will be the same size. The Milky Way is going to be bigger now. Who knows? Cool? But yeah, yeah, the Andromeda is easy to measure because we can see the extent of it, but hard because it's far away. Milky Way is right here, so measurements are comparatively easier, except we're stuck in the middle of it. So so place your bets uh, when Andromeda... Yeah, we can do over-unders. When, when do Andromeda some. and Milky Way do end up colliding, hmm. who's going to be the bigger galaxy? It's going to be one merged galaxy. Well, I just think. before, just before. Who's just in charge? Before. Yeah, who's, who's in charge? Yeah, we'll try and figure out the pecking order. So, you know. So Andromeda is at the center of our gravitational well in our local universe, right? In our, our little uh, galaxy cluster. But so I'll it, go with Andromeda. Is it anymore? That's the, uh, that's the question, right? Now that Andromeda the, so, is losing its stature and the Milky Way is gaining in stature. So... Could very I well have be. a question for you then. Do we know how much dark matter is in our galaxy? Ooh, Paul. I don't think we do. We have a rough estimate based on our... So we know that the amount of mass within our, the orbit of our own sun. Correct. Because right? you get that just uh, from dynamics. So you can measure the mass. Uh, but then that's not the complete picture since we're only two thirds of the way out and estimating the size of our dark matter halo is once again, this is a very difficult problem. Uh, you can tackle it based on, you know, uh, orbits of globular clusters, the speeds of these stars at the edge of the disk and out into the halo. 
by looking at simulations and other galaxies of the correlation between the disk size and the dark matter halo mass. And you can build up, I imagine some, and I'm sure we do have some sort of estimate, but I'm guessing it's not as solid as estimate as we would hope. Yeah, and it's not as much as uh, the Andromeda galaxy itself. So at some point you have to actually, uh, when you're asking a question, which galaxy is larger? Are we what, talking what about size or we're talking yeah. about mass? Have yeah, you? and really what matters is the mass and radius of the dark matter halo. The gas, yeah. the dust, the stars, the planets, the people are insignificant in the mass of a, of a galaxy. So so just to be clear here, they've is th uh, this may be a different press release because we just had the AAS meeting. So mm -hmm. um, this is a press release that came from the University of Arizona. Oh, and, did I pull the wrong paper? And maybe, but it's the same date. So um, and in this one, they're saying that they measure the angular momentum They use the angular momentum of the galaxies, which provides a more reliable result. It's on University well, I'm sure they of Arizona. That. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, um, and it's a uh, technique that can be used for both uh, the Milky Way and other galaxies. So, But this is not talking about the size of the galaxy. This is talking about the mass. Of and the that's galaxy. why I was confused, because I was uh, that was in my head, Paul. And so I was thinking uh, it was mass, and you were thinking about this. Anyway, you know what? This show has gone completely off the rails. We're going to move on. <laughs> <laughs> um, and now we're going to talk about poor, poor opportunity. And uh, I know, right? Yeah. So let me just uh, sort of set the stage for you here. So, of course, the Opportunity rover is uh, happily on the surface of Mars, or it was, and has been there for now um, 13 years, 14 years, yeah. more than 5,000 days it's been operating. It was only supposed to go for 90 days, and they thought yep. that the solar panels were going to run out of energy, that the dust was going to collect on the solar panels, and it would get too cold, and it wouldn't be able to keep itself warm because it needs to keep all of its electronics above uh, negative 20 degrees uh, Celsius okay. or zero when it's recharging. So um, Opportunity has gone through a bunch of dust storms, uh, and the previous one, they have this thing called they call tau value, and the previous tau value was 5.5. And there's a dust storm now that's on Mars. And you can see, I'll, I'll show you some, some pictures and, and videos of it in a second, um, that has reached a tau of 10.8. And that's all just gibberish, right, obviously. Uh, but it's a logarithmic scale. So it's not like 5.10.8 is, is twice as much as 5.5. It's um, right now, the solar panels on Opportunity are producing uh, two milliwatts of power. So, so normally they produce whatever is like a 80, 100 watts of power. So it is dark as night for where opportunity is on on Mars right now. And in during the past times, and this is sort of what took spirit out was it just it got too cold, it got too dark, it wasn't able to keep itself warm, and it died. And so uh, NASA just did a big press conference uh, earlier today and showed off some pictures of, of what's going on. They were able to communicate with the rover until just a little while ago. And now it's going to it's hunkering down and they're going to hope it's going to be able to to survive through this. And even if it does, you know, every time there's one of these dust storms, you get this dust collecting down on the solar panels, and that's mm. going to potentially reduce the amount of power that it gets as well. So, so this could be it for opportunity. So, doesn't it have some kind of a safe mode on it so that when the batteries reach under a specific level, it would just shut? down it's, by itself and maintain itself yeah so opportunity has two ways of keeping its electronics warm it's got these tiny mm -hmm. little pe <clears throat> pellets of, of plutonium which are decaying so it's kind of like got a mini uh radio isotope thermoelectric Nuclear, generator yeah. inside of it it's got these i think eight little pellets and they provide mm -hmm. a sort of a background amount of warmth for the electronics but then it mm -hmm. also has heaters that it runs it you know at night it you know collects energy during the day then runs these heaters at night and sort of keeps the whole system balanced and uh the problem is that as the rover gets older the amount of electricity that it's able to bring in from 
with these solar panels is sort of slowly degrading. Its batteries are slowly degrading, and the sort of the total amount of power that it can generate just keeps going down and down. And at this point, this is the kind of storm that can take it offline. And Uh, and it's a it's a monster it is the most powerful the darkest dust storm that's been seen on mars since essentially observations have been made from the ground so and these dust storms are insane yeah uh they, they will i don't know has this one covered the entire globe yet i don't think it has yet but it's uh and i'm gonna try and dig up some of the uh some of the videos you can kind of see what's going on and they did sort of a simulated view okay here we go i'm going to just apologize to the people who are listening to this in podcast form so there is a simulated view of what the sun looked like before the dust storm and then what it is now and it's essentially the sun is just this really faint dot in the sky at this point and and they're sort of also showing um, and there is some video that I've seen of the of the dust storm, but uh, again, for the people that are watching this right now, this is the dust storm. So it's it's a goodly half of the planet, you know, maybe a third of the planet. It's like one whole hemisphere is a raging dust storm. And it's not like it will go away tomorrow or a couple of days. These things will blow for weeks or months. That's right. Yeah, they can take a long time. There's been, you know, and as you said, right, there can be global dust storms. So a dust storm can just can build up that just then takes over the entire planet and there's no solar power for anyone down there. Now, this isn't a problem for Curiosity because oh. Curiosity is, of course, has oh. is nuclear powered while Opportunity is solar powered. So, solar. so what's what I find very interesting here, though, is that uh, we have an, an opportunity to observe extreme weather phenomena on Mars. Because if, if something like that has never been observed before, uh, that shows that uh, Mars has a very unique and very violent, um, turbulent atmosphere that we definitely need to, to understand before we decide to actually send anybody there. Yeah, so, and I think can you imagine uh, being there during this storm? So, In your colony on solar power yeah yeah, yes, yeah. You're calling, right right well t- i mean this was one of the things that they showed in the martian right where uh he was stuck uh, because of this really powerful windstorm but the thing is, is that because the air pressure on mars is one one hundredth that it what it is on earth the actual mm-hmm. strength of the winds is fairly weak so it just yeah. would be dark and it would be windy but it dusty. wouldn't be dangerously windy it would just be dusty and dark and then that dust would get everywhere and on everything now the only saving grace and zephan zephan is measuring mentioning this in the comments is that because it has this dust it's actually insulating the region of the planet so the temperature variations aren't as bad as it would be if it was nice clear skies so hopefully if the dust storm doesn't last too long it can weather it won't I, i read into that a little bit more and it might be i'm not sure about this at all it might help stabilize the temperature of the atmosphere uh, but the surface can still stay really cold no it, the yeah. temperature will still stay cold but it won't necessarily go through the same kinds of dramatic variations from day to night that it does during just uniformly miserable it's, it's exactly yeah <laughs> it's just it's too cold for rovers all the time as opposed to yeah you know some of the time yeah exactly so no, this is not good. This is not good. This yeah, could I mean, be when we lose. But going back to uh, Stella's point, like we're seeing extreme dust storms. We had the announcements last week of these of these methane spikes, these anomalous methane spikes. Like the the atmospheres of these worlds outside of Earth do some really really crazy and fascinating stuff using trans flows of energy chemical processes that really are alien to our experiences here on earth and i find them incredibly engrossing yes but should humans live there Mm, or if you were designing a great segue if you were designing like your own (laughs) space for or or, you know a random country reached out to you like india that has a growing space program and a presence in space and they said hey fraser kane you're the guy Mm -hmm. uh finally 
Finally. Finally, someone is going to. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Are we going to go to Mars and or are we going to go to the moon? And the reason I'm bringing this up is I was invited to, uh, for my opinion, uh, in the print in, in India, along with a few other scientists and engineers and aerospace type people about this exact question of, you know, you got some money to spend, you want to do something cool. What do you do? So what do you pick, Mars or moon? If I had to choose, I would go with the moon personally. Um, because? Well, because the moon is close and space is hard and and deadly. And so there are a million lessons to be learned about space exploration. And the way you learn them is you rapidly iterate. You learn a tiny lesson, you fix it, you learn another lesson, you fix that. And the longer you can go without having catastrophic problems, the better off you are. And you then truly learn to live in space. And then you can try to go to places that are farther away. So the moon is only three days away. If they run out of toilet paper, you can send more. The toilet paper shipment. Do you think that, like, I totally get that. But the moon presents some interesting challenges that are alleviated by Mars. Like Mars is bigger, mm -hmm. has stronger gravity, has more water under the surface, has a carbon dioxide atmosphere that is currently busy generating <laughs> a global right. dust storm. Right. But, you know, when it's on more friendly terms, you can extract it, turn it into fuel. And so there are some challenges you have to solve on the moon that you would iterate over and over and over that you wouldn't have to solve by going to Mars. Yes and no. I mean, I think that there are a bunch of them that I think there are, I mean, personally, I'm not a fan of either one. I mean, I'm a fan of learning just to live in space itself, that that, that is the greatest challenge is that if you can learn to live in the hostile environment of space to deal with the radiation, to be able to figure out how to get your resources, to be able to go to and fro and, and live in sort of a closed environment, then you've mastered the techniques you, that you can then go and adapt if you're going to go live down on the moon or if you're going to fly out to Mars, or you want to go live on Titan, you can adapt those, those technologies. I think that that rotating space habitats personally is is the way to go but I, but really until all are tried until we spend more time learning to live in space we won't really know um i'm not a fan of of setting any kind of goal i'm always there's this great i've, I've probably mentioned this in the past there's this great plan that came out of nasa about 10 years ago called a capabilities driven approach to space exploration. And the gist of it is it's like, just stop picking goals because you know that the goals are just going to change as the administration changes. And instead just do what they did during the Gemini program where they just said, we're just going to keep a person in space alive for a little bit longer. Now we're going to keep two people in space. Now we're going to have them dock some spaceship together and stay alive. And then they're going to do a spacewalk. And I think that that same technique could keep going. Now let's try and keep people in a high orbit, in a cislunar orbit. Let's do a resupply mission. Let's repair a geostationary satellite. Let's. So that's that's my that's my approach. What was your take? You're it's the one who got like, asked your opinion. It's well, almost like a, a list of achievements in Kerbal Space yeah, Program. Yeah, exactly. It is. You know something, it, it all depends on why you want to go where you want to go, right? Is it just to actually have a touchdown and say, you know, been there, done that, gone? Or is it because you want to explore a specific planet? Or is it because you want to use it for refueling in order to keep going? Or is it because you want to use it as a, as a weather or a, a seismic station or anything like that? Personally, actually, if I am to be out in space, I want to keep going. I would just just keep going, just keep, keep going. looking, uh, seeing something new. I, I yeah. would be completely bored, even in, on, on the moon or on Mars. It's it's a very desolate, very boring, very uniform place. It's like, whatever. Yeah. yeah, and that was actually that was my ultimate answer: was decide what you want to do first, and the target will follow. Yeah, yeah, and I it's I don't good think, point. yeah, and I guess for me, I don't think it's possible for like the goal is to keep humans alive in space and to be capable of exploring as much of the solar system as it eventually makes sense to do. And yeah. the only way to do that, you know, 
is to keep humans alive longer and farther from the earth yeah. with better technology. And so the, the, the two points in there, the first one is that if you really are serious about sending people to Mars and keeping them alive, as you're, you're saying, Fraser, you may as well just send uh, something to Mars and bring it back because you have to have a plan B to bring them back in case of emergency. A Some people B. disagree with that. Oh, yeah. sure. <laughs> okay. I, that, that's my take. Though. One way trips uh, to Mars is sort of the main what? thinking now <laughs> these days. Wow. Uh, and the second thing that I wanted to say is that if you are to go to a different planet, why not go somewhere that is really interesting? Just go fishing in Europa, for example. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah, go swim with the Europa. You're Canadian, Fraser. You have familiarity with ice fishing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I can't wait to go swimming with the European space whales and there you go. and learn their their mystical, whale song. Their, their mystical wisdom. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Can I come with you? <laughs> well, as, soon as, <laughs> as soon as the capabilities driven uh, mission to Europa is ready to go, uh, yeah, everyone's invited. Excellent. All right, so I've got one last story here that I'm going to talk about and Paul, you had sort of a spin on it, which I thought was kind of interesting. So this is <laughs> a spin turns a out spin. to be a great Oh. I didn't even think of that. I see what you did there. All right. So the discovery is that astronomers have found, or astronomers have known about this sort of background microwave radiation that's coming from across the galaxy. And so they call it anomalous microwave emission. And they kind of didn't know what it was. But one thing that they thought it might be was a type of organic molecule called a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. And Love that a wow. uh, which is kind of exciting for there to be these these organic molecules out there but a sort of new study thanks to the green bank telescope which is a radio telescope is that they have identified that what these these microwaves probably are in fact is teeny tiny diamonds in newly forming uh solar systems out there and so these things are, are microscopic. I forget they said they're in the nanometer scale. Nanoscopic. The nanoscopic. <laughs> and these these <laughs> diamonds are found actually here. They're they're found in uh, meteorites here on Earth. So we know that they were present back in the early history of the of the solar system. And so they, what was the technique they used? So they were able to sort of use the the Green Bank Telescope to peer at three newly forming star systems and were able to sort of perfectly match the signal that they were getting from from these systems to this idea of these nano diamonds they're like tiny little diamonds that are rapidly spinning and they are giving off microwave photons out into space as they spin and good news for the folks that are like wondering if this is going to mess with the cosmic microwave background because it's weakly polarized. It looks like it doesn't have a real impact and probably won't be one of the kinds of dust that was messing up potentially the BICEP2 uh, observations of the uh, primordial gravitational waves. So there you so go. I have, tiny a, I have a question. Diamonds for everyone. I have a question. I have a question. So aren't these interstellar or are they are stellar? So are they forming uh, clouds or fa forming stars or are they well, just found this, around? This analysis was based on protoplanetary disks, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh. yeah. And they're thought maybe they get blown out into the interstellar medium, and but then they, be, they need to be heated in order to be seen uh, in the infrared, which is how they see this correlation. Uh, then they get blown out and cooled where they create anomalous microwave signature, but you don't see it any other way. So they have to be close to baby stars. To be seen in the infrared, yeah. To be seen in the infrared. Okay, that sounds cool. Yeah. Lots of diamonds for everyone. Lots of diamonds for everyone. Say. Uh, all right. Well, I think it's we're sort of nearing the end of the of the show. Uh, Paul, why don't you uh, shamelessly self promote something that you're working on? Hey, my book is out November twentieth this year, but it is available for pre order. Of course, go to pmsutter.com slash book, and there are links to oh, Amazon, smart. Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, all that kind of stuff, where you can buy your copy now. It's not signed; doesn't have a special note. Oh. I'm not you a shout out or anything it's just it's purely transactional you buy and then you're guaranteed to get a copy of the book 
Is it autographed? <laughs> no, he's, he's, he's not autographed. It's ah, not. It's yeah. all you know, corporate, faceless, roboticized. <laughs> it's just a book. Paul, but, you're killing us. Oh, What's the you, book about? It, it's about the universe. It's called Your Place in the Universe: Understanding Our Big Messy Existence. It is the story of our universe, the story of how we understood it and haven't understood it over the past four hundred years and uh, how we've wrestled with the fact of this vast, unblinking monster of a cosmos that we find ourselves in. Awesome. I think that Fraser and I are going to go bite, read it, and, and question you. Yeah, well, there, um, Baron, there'll have to be Baron. an episode where you're the special guest of the week yeah. we're coming out, Paul. In November, yeah. yeah. When it's I'll come join you guys. Yes, oh boy. So our ah. book... I just got the, um, or, or Dave Dickinson and I just got the the rough draft, the laid out version of the book that we're doing. Um, and so it's a really weird feeling to go through the book and actually see all the pictures in place and all of the, the graphics and stuff. And our book's coming out on October 23rd. Oh, goodness. Yeah. So we're having a book club. We are having a book club. <laughs> Morgan and Kimberly will need to catch up. Um, <laughs> Uh, Very nice. So, uh, but I guess I just sort of rode on Paul's tailcoats there, but I just want to say that I, uh, my shameless self-promotion this week is I just put up a video yesterday f about the four big space observatories that are coming after James Webb and after W first. So, uh, HabEx, Lynx, the Origin Space Telescope, and the Louvoir, which are four telescopes that I really, really want to exist. And I'm sure they won't in the form that they're in right now. But uh, if you want to sort of know what could be coming by the time your grandchildren are astronomers, uh, you should check out that video. And that's on my on my regular channel. Stella, do you have something uh, you want to shamelessly self-promote that you're working on besides the AVSO? I'm working on the AVSO, actually. Uh, we have uh, lots of really exciting new things coming up. Uh, we are uh, translating more man manuals. We are refreshing our infrastructure, our software, our hardware. Uh, we have to actually move to different operating systems, but this is an opportunity for us to restructure our web page a little bit. Uh, we are having our upcoming meeting uh, with the British Astronomical Association it's coming up in about a month from now in Warwick, UK. And our fall meeting, our annual meeting is going to be on my birthday, November 15th uh, in Flagstaff. We're going to the Lowell Observatory. We actually uh, have an amazing group of uh, guest speakers from the test satellite um, we have um, people from NASA coming. Uh, we have also organized a, a tour of uh, the facilities up at Lowell and perhaps an open night if, if the, the sky, uh, the weather actually um, collaborates. So um, stick with us. There, there are lots of really cool stuff ha happening great. in 2018. It's a really good year. Um, all right. And then, of course, go to aavso.org to be able to, yes. to see what you're up to. And follow us on Facebook. And We're there. So we are down to a couple of shows left before we go on hiatus. I just want to remind you that the best way to uh, handle the dark times over the summer, like opportunity, <laughs> huddled up under the dust storms, is to join the Weekly Space Hangout crew. This is the community. Go to wshcrew.space. They will take good care of you and help you come back. We have two more episodes um next week is dr jillian scudder and after that it's going to be stephen van buren and then we are going to be on hiatus so two more shows all right let's put everyone on the gallery view here so that everyone can see us there we all are so thanks everyone for watching thanks of course to the WSH crew, thanks to everyone uh, in our panel. Really appreciate it. And we'll see you all next week. Bye, everybody. Buy my book. <laughs> Bye.